As Europe suffers, three great kingdoms are emerging in West Africa. Mele, or Mali. Ghana, and Songhai. These were lands of enormous wealth, generated by their control of the trade routes across the Sahara, and the abundance of their gold mines. The kingdoms were known for their benevolent governments and their great respect for learning. Many of the stories of Africa are told here, the British Museum in London. This is where thousands of artifacts, collected, bought, and taken from the continent, ended up. When they were first discovered, objects from the ancient kingdoms of West Africa stunned the world. None more so than these extraordinary plaques. They came from what was once the Kingdom of Benin and are around 500 years old. Our travel to modern-day Nigeria, where the Kingdom of Benin reached its height in the 16th century. And I'll reach even further back in time and explore a panoply of ancient cities and kingdoms in West Africa, founded many centuries before Benin. I look for evidence in what's now Mali of how ancient culture and technologies made Benin and its bronzes possible. The center of power of the Kingdom of Benin was Benin City. Today it's one of Nigeria's thriving cities, home to over a million Africans. The main circle in the center is dotted with statues, public art, depicting Benin's history. For 600 years until the late 19th century, it dominated this part of West Africa. These aren't carvings. They're 16th century casts in copper-rich alloys of brass and bronze. Over 900 plaques are thought to have been made. To produce each one, the artist would need to know how to make and fire a clay mold and how to melt the metals to pour into it. It's an incredibly difficult skill to master. The combination of relatively sophisticated science and artistic accomplishment baffled most European 19th century observers. They couldn't believe that so-called primitives had been capable of producing work of the same standard as their European contemporaries. These amazing objects just didn't match the Europeans' view of West Africans. The questions were, where did they get the technology to develop this amazing bronze work? Now, a lot of people say, well, why don't you talk about West Africa? The Dogons say they come out of Egypt. Mm. They science come out of Egypt. And there are some symbols that seem to reoccur. The leopard. That leopard skin, right, the leopard come out of the interior of Africa. Study it. Study the, uh, the murals of ancient Egypt. All of the priests wore the leopard skin. With a leopard at the Oba's feet and standard bearers at his side, it's like one of the Benin bronzes come to life. Now, here we go. See Bess? See Bessie? And the brothers still today are wearing the leopard skins. Mm. They still wear them. This is proof po positive that that science came up out of southern Africa. Here, you see right here, this is I. This is I, the king that came after Tutankhamen. See him with the leopard skin on? Just like our brothers in Southern Africa. Right now today, you got to study them zoo types. You got to study them zoo types. All of the zoo types of ancient Kemet are indigenous African animals. Now, one of them is not indigenous, okay? And right here again, you see the Egyptian priest. You see that tail? You see that tail? No, that might be that queen, but that's daddy. They got some that got the tail connected to it. But you see the leopard skin, which is sacred to the Egyptian priest. The snake, the crocodile, so obviously they were very important. I want to find out what they mean and why they were so important to these people. And you can see right there, even right with the Uranus. You see right here, you see right here the cobra, and you see the vulture, uh, Wajet, and the cobra deity, Wajet. What is that? I got to get on my science family. But both of those, that's the, uh, the goddess of the north and the goddess of the south. Mm -hmm. 
And you can see it's the same concept right here with our brothers in Benin. It's the same concept, family. So Kimmy, a lot, when they came in and conquered, a lot of the brothers fled into West Africa. It's the same science. These recurring images remind me of the symbolic motifs in Renaissance art. I think they carry hidden layers of meaning beyond the understanding of the imperialistic Brits. Now look at that from Benin. Now you're going to tell me that ain't the same hat on his head? Please, God. That's right. I got to I got to Can you see it? Am I lying? Is that the same hat, my dude? About it done. <laughs> All right, then. It's the same hat. They bust. They bust. The dough guys say they come out of Egypt. Mm. They science come out of Egypt. In the heart of Africa, on the southwestern edge of the Sahara, lives a nation of peasant warriors who call themselves the Dogon. For centuries, they have remained fiercely independent, guarding their villages and fields against intrusion from the outside world. Living in widely scattered villages in a turbulent landscape of sandstone, between huge escarpments and inaccessible cliffs, the Dogon cling to a strong religious identity with concepts of nature and the universe that are unique among the so-called primitive peoples of Africa. These beliefs, interwoven in a tapestry of complex symbols and legends, are known only to a handful of tribal elders. In preparation for the ritual, a tribal artist begins an elaborate map of the universe. The words of the Ogan are translated into an astonishingly accurate view of the heavens. The planets of our solar system are shown in their proper orbits around the sun. The rings of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter, invisible to the naked eye, are described in accurate detail. But most remarkable is their knowledge of a distant star called by them Potolo. Named for a seed, Potolo orbits the star Sirius in the constellation Canis Major. Astronomer Charles Alcock of the California Institute of Technology, with Thomas Bellows, a computer programmer, search for scientific truth in the Dogon legend. Astronomers now know that Sirius does, in fact, have a small companion star invisible to the naked eye. The coordinates from these observations will be fed into a computer to determine the size, weight, and precise orbit of the sacred star. The computer now confirms what the Dogon have known for centuries. A small, incredibly dense star makes an orbit around Sirius every 50 Earth years. The Dogon say they come out of Egypt. They science come out of Egypt. Robert, the, the, the ancestors of the Dogon tribe, where did they come from then? <clears throat> well, the Dogon say they came from up north, and, and we know that they came across the Sahara. And so I set about a very lengthy research process to find out who the hell were these ancestors and where did they come from, just as you've asked. And I managed to trace most of the bits and pieces and details of the Dogon information to ancient Egypt. And so they seem to have um, been <clears throat> a group who were um, religious purists of, uh, of a priestly nature who believed that only by leaving Egypt at some moment of crisis, which can't have been later than the New Kingdom and, and, and may well have been earlier, we don't know, um, that they thought that they could only preserve the the true uh, secrets of Sirius by em emigrating in order to, pre to preserve it intact without contamination by some religious change. But they kept these traditions. Now the god that, uh, or the, of the Dogon tribe is called Amma, A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, Amma, which is basically the same as Amun, or Amun. Mm -hmm. Sure is. And th that's the name of their god today. Their calendar, their sacred calendar, was based entirely upon the star Sirius, not on the sun and the moon. Of course, they had solar and lunar calendars as well, as the Dogon do. The, the Dogon even have a Venus calendar. <clears throat> They've got four calendars. And um, all of this 
information seems to have been brought from ancient Egypt. So Timmy, when they came in and conquered, a lot of the brothers fled into West Africa. It's the same science. 